It was a night like any other. You ate some dinner, chatted with the family, then suddenly you were gone. But they didn't need to worry. You just snuck off for a second to play Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the mobile puzzle adventure game you want to play for hours on end, even when you only have a few moments to spare. From the vibrant artwork and adventure pack storyline to the cute collectible characters and supercharged power-ups, Best Fiends is designed to be the most obsession-worthy game ever. There are literally thousands of levels, plus tons of in-game events added every month for even more ways to win. And the best part is, you can play anytime, anywhere. No Wi-Fi? No problem. Of course, people may start to wonder about your mysterious disappearances until they see how much fun you're having. Download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Fiends. Hello, and welcome to Campus Crime Chronicles. I'm your host, Nicole Turner, former college professor, current college administrator, but always a true crime addict. In every episode of this podcast, I take a deep dive into some sort of true crime that occurred on a school campus or is associated with a college or university in some way. For each episode, I rate the seriousness of the crime from one to five on my very own serious crime scale, with one being completely not serious, possibly even a little humorous from time to time, to five being very serious. This episode is rated a three, I think. (laughs) Honestly, I wasn't sure what to rate this episode because nobody was murdered or hurt for that matter, but the potential of harm in this case is unreal. And I'm just thankful authorities were able to put a stop to this person before he wreaked havoc, potentially resulting in immeasurable harm. This episode is titled Professor of Arson. So without further ado, let's get started. To begin, let's first imagine what it's like to be a firefighter. Imagine that you are fighting a massive wildfire, one that would eventually end up being the second largest wildfire in the state's history. But while you are fighting the fire with every ounce of energy you have, because that's literally in your job description, you are also having to dodge flames from a different direction. Flames that were not initially there or going wildly, but flames that have since ignited in an area that was your out, an area that was completely free of any fire at all, and it was a safe place for you to retreat to as you're fighting the flames in front of you. As in, You are now trapped between a large wildfire in front of you, basically a fire that's on three sides of you, but now you're also having to deal with an additional fire that started behind you on the fourth side, the side you thought was safe, the part that was initially considered to be the evacuation zone. This seems like a nightmare or the beginning of an intense thriller suspense movie, one of those types of movies, whatever they're called. But unfortunately, it was the reality for several firefighters who were selflessly fighting to extinguish California's Dixie wildfire during the summer of 2021. This story starts on July 20th of this year, when a man riding a mountain bike in Cascade, California, noticed smoke on the western slope of Mount Shasta near the Bunny Flat Trailhead. When he noticed the smoke, the mountain biker immediately called 911 to report it. According to an article in the Mount Shasta News, firefighters from the U.S. Forest Service and CAL FIRE responded quickly and were able to completely extinguish the flames and keep the total area burned to about 10 by 10 feet or 100 square feet. However, NPR reported that the total area affected by the fire might have actually extended beyond 100 square feet, but firefighters were able to put it out before it could spread to over 200 square feet. Upon initially responding to the fire, investigators weren't sure how it started or what caused the flames to ignite in the first place. 
But after surveying the scene a little further, one investigator noticed a man nearby who was struggling to free his black Kia Soul. The man and his car were spotted on a dirt road about 150 to 200 yards away from the fire. Apparently, according to CBS News, the man's vehicle tires were stuck in a rut or a ditch, and the undercarriage of the car was stuck on a partially buried boulder in the ground. A witness also told investigators that he noticed that same man arrived to the area several hours before the fire started. The witness then watched the man walk off in the direction of where the fire ignited, and then the man returned to his car about 10 minutes later. The witness said that when the man returned, that's when the smoke became visible. However, sources are unclear whether this witness who saw the man in the car was the same person as the mountain biker who initially called 911. But regardless, there was a suspicious man in the area doing suspicious things, (laughs) which immediately put this suspicious man on investigators' radar. According to the reporting of Bill Chapel for NPR, when one investigator at the scene first saw this man, who actually was later identified as Gary Stephen Maynard of San Jose, California, but when the investigator first saw him, he kept his distance, particularly because when the investigator did approach Maynard, he became agitated and uncooperative. But the investigator from the U.S. Forest Service did take a picture of Maynard's car and his license plates, which is actually what led them to identify Maynard because he was the registered owner of the vehicle. According to an article in the New York Times by Christine Hauser, that same investigator also noticed burned newspaper and a match at the site near the man's car. However, they also did their due diligence and documented the tread pattern left by Maynard's car. Put that little nugget of information in your back pocket and hold on to it because I will come back to it. Once they had a name of a person to investigate, Tyler Bolin, a U.S. Forest Service special agent, hit the ground running on trying to find out all he could about Maynard. Bolin said he used a variety of means to track down more information about Maynard because he was now officially a suspect. Why, you may ask? Well, it's because the U.S. Forest Service, upon further investigation of the scene, determined that this fire, the fire that was started on July 20th in Cascade, California, was the result of arson. Bolin soon discovered that Maynard was a 47-year-old former college professor who has ties to several colleges around the country. He was an adjunct faculty member at Santa Clara University from September 2019 to December 2020, and in the fall of 2020, he was also a part-time lecturer at Sonoma State University in the Criminology and Criminal Justice Department. According to his faculty biography at Sonoma State, Maynard has three different master's degrees, and he also has a doctorate degree from Stony Brook University in New York. Oh, And I would ask you to guess what his teaching and research interests are, but it's so ironic that it's laughable. (laughs) Yeah, apparently, this guy's teaching and research topics focus on sociology of health, environmental sociology, and deviance and crime. What? (laughs) I cannot make this stuff up. Anyway, While Bolin was conducting his investigation into Maynard, yet another fire started the next day on July 21st. This time, according to the New York Times, a fire crew on the Everett Memorial Highway spotted a glow of another fire on the western slope of Mount Shasta. But this time, it was at a location on the mountain about an hour south of the Oregon border. Luckily, this fire was contained to less than an acre, but an investigator from the U.S. Forest Service noticed some tire marks in the dirt near the fire. Those tire marks were very similar, if not identical, to the marks of Maynard's Kia from the scene of the previous fire the day before. How did they know this? Well, remember that piece of information I told you to hold on to? (laughs) Well, because of the tread marks they documented the day before as well. I do want to point out, though, that both of the fire locations, the one on July 20th and the one on July 21st, were located in areas of the Shasta Trinity National Forests, which, according to Google Maps, is a group of federally designated forests that span across over 2.2 million acres and is considered California's largest national forest. Now, 
after two fires, investigators were on Maynard's trail more than ever. They had to figure out if this guy was involved and if so, how the hell to stop him. But Maynard was on the move and tracking him would pose some difficulty. But let me tell you, the U.S. Forest Service isn't playing around and they hit the ground running. In his investigation, Bolin, the U.S. Forest Service agent, soon discovered through the U.S. Department of Agriculture that Maynard had an electronic benefits transfer account. For those of you unfamiliar with this, you might recognize its acronym of EBT, which is the food stamps program in the U.S. where funds are placed onto a type of credit or debit card, and then it can be used as a form of payment at most food marts and grocery stores. So what they did was genius, in my personal opinion. When they discovered he had food stamps or an EBT card, they traced his use of the card at local grocery stores in the area. According to NPR, on July 18th, Maynard made purchases at a Safeway in Fontana, California, a city located along the California coastline. Then, a week later, he made purchases at another Safeway in Susanville, California, which is at least 260 miles away from Fontana. In addition, Maynard's car was registered in San Jose, where he resided, so Agent Boland also contacted the San Jose Police Department. They shared with Bolin that in 2020, a colleague had actually reported Maynard to police because the colleague was worried about Maynard's well-being and concerned that he was suffering from a severe mental health crisis. The San Jose Police Department also crucially provided Bolin with Maynard's cell phone number, which was later confirmed to be linked to his EBT account. It's beginning to feel a lot like summer. And the Home Depot has savings on everything you need to get it started this Memorial Day. Step up your grill game with propane griddles from Next Grill for the perfect smash burger. Then feast with your friends and family around a new patio set from Hampton Bay. However you plan to kick off summer, the Home Depot has savings on everything you need to do it right. Feels like Memorial Day at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. At JCPenney's Memorial Day sale, sizzling deals are on with storewide doorbusters all weekend. Or bring home savings up to 50% during our Memorial Day home sale. Save even more with your coupon. And for all former and active military personnel, enjoy an extra 10% off in-store. Just show a valid military or VA ID at checkout. Shopping is back. JCPenney. Coupon valid on select styles through 530. Some exclusions apply. Doorbusters valid 526 through 530 and excluded from coupons. See store or jcp.com for details. After this, investigators were able to connect Maynard to a string of fires by tracing his whereabouts and movements, though they still didn't have full proof. But in late July of 2021, they grew so concerned about Maynard and where he may strike next that they asked Verizon to provide 15-minute updates on his location 24 hours a day. Eventually, an agent even installed a tracker onto Maynard's Kia Soul on August 3rd. However, sources are inconsistent on how they actually placed the tracker on the car. The New York Times reported that they did it while Maynard was inside a restaurant and his car was parked in the parking lot. But CBS News and the Associated Press reported the tracking device was placed on his car after he was stopped briefly by police. Regardless of how they got it on there, though, they began tracking Maynard for hundreds of miles as he traveled across Northern California in what they describe as a, quote, arson spree, end quote. Basically, this is the scene I want you to picture. Maynard was driving around setting fires while law enforcement was having to keep track of him literally keep track of him with that tracking device. So they were following behind him hundreds of miles at a time, putting out several fires behind him and gathering evidence that could 100% without question link him to the blazes. But here's the thing. They were doing this all while a massive wildfire was raging in Northern California known as the Dixie Fire, which has since been documented as the second largest wildfire in the state. According to its Wikipedia page, the Dixie Fire burned from July 13th to October 25th of this year when it was finally 100% contained. It spanned across five different counties consisting of Butte, Plumas, Lassen, Shasta, and Tahoma counties, and the fire scorched over 960,000 acres and 1,500 square miles, and it destroyed over 1,000 buildings and structures. 
Before I continue with the story, I want to describe the area that I'm talking about in this episode because I think the geography in this case is a bit difficult to understand and it gets a bit confusing if you're not from California or familiar with the state, which I'm not, so bear with me. But essentially, all of this was taking place in Northern California. At the time, according to CBS News, Maynard was living in his car and traveling across a large portion of Northern California, which is where both the Shasta Trinity National Forest and Lassen National Forest are located. It's also where the Dixie Fire flames were ablaze for over three months. So, moving on with the story, on August 7th, Maynard was finally arrested, but not before striking again. According to NPR, a California Highway Patrol officer pulled Maynard over for driving in an emergency closure area. But guess what Maynard had been up to that very day? If you said starting fires, of course you'd be right. He had camped the night before in the Lassen National Forest and he started two different fires that day. One they referred to as the Ranch Fire and the other the Conard or Conard Fire both inside the Lassen National Forest and both in the vicinity of the Dixie Fire that was still raging on at this point. According to the New York Times, these two fires were set about three miles apart and they grew to half an acre to one acre in size before firefighters could put them out. I know this is a bit confusing, but I did post a map to my social media. The map shows the areas where Maynard started the fires, which also shows just how close they are to the actual Dixie fire that fire crews were battling in the midst of some rando, (laughs) aka Maynard, who was trying to trap them, literally trap them in with his pesky but highly dangerous little blazes of arson. Court documents even said, quote, Maynard's fires were placed in the perfect position to increase the risk of firefighters being trapped between fires, end quote. So when police arrested Maynard on this day, August 7th, 2021, they had clearly had enough. But at this point, all they could do was arrest him and book him into the Lassen County Jail on suspicion of unauthorized entry into a closed emergency area, which is a state law violation. But when a deputy later told Maynard that a federal felony charge of arson was being added, Maynard became angry and insisted on his innocence. According to NPR, he reportedly told the deputy, quote, I'm going to kill you fucking pigs. I told those fuckers I didn't start any of those fires, end quote. Um, okay. <laughs> wow. Anyway, Maynard was later transferred to the Sacramento County Jail, but when it came time for him to go in front of the judge at his bail hearing, the attorney for the Eastern District of California, Philip A. Talbert, asked that Maynard be kept in detention. Talbert noted the additional risk that Maynard's arson fires posed to firefighters, as well as how difficult it would be to continue tracking him on his little arson spree. Talbert said, quote, where Maynard went, fire started, not just once, but over and over again, end quote. The judge, of course, agreed wholeheartedly and denied Maynard's bail. The judge said there are, quote, no conditions or combination of conditions that would provide the necessary level of safety to this community should the defendant be released. Based on that finding, the defendant will be detained as a risk of non-appearance and a danger to the community, end quote. So, Let's talk about just how much of a danger this guy really was. As of August 2021, court documents allege that Maynard was connected to a string of more than a half a dozen dangerous fires in Northern California. Authorities said that in the five days before Maynard was actually taken into custody, he allegedly set three different fires. The two I told you about from August 7th, the Ranch and Conard fires, but authorities also allege he started another one on August 5th, which they called the Moon Fire. However, they also said he could be connected to several more, one even dating as far back as the Bradley Fire on July 11th, which destroyed over 300 acres. But they said he could even be connected to a fire as early as July 6th, the Sweetbriar Fire, because both the Bradley and Sweetbriar Fires struck in the Mount Shasta area northwest of the Lassen National Forest. 
From August 7th to now, basically, Maynard has been held in custody in the Sacramento County Jail. But on November 18th, Maynard was officially indicted by a federal grand jury and charged with four counts of arson to federal property and one count of setting timber afire. If convicted, because I suppose I should say that he is technically innocent until proven guilty, right? (laughs) Yes, I'm hardcore rolling my eyes. But if he is convicted, Maynard faces up to 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine for each count of arson. According to the New York Times, Maynard's lawyer, Hannah Labory, said, quote, Mr. Maynard has consistently denied the allegations and he will enter a formal plea of not guilty at his hearing next week, end quote, which is exactly what he did at his arraignment on November 22nd. I'm assuming (laughs) because apparently whatever happened wasn't newsworthy enough for media to cover it. And there have been no further updates since he was officially indicted on November 18th. So that's pretty much where the story ends. Maynard is sitting in jail. The Dixie wildfire is thankfully completely out. And now we just wait for the trial, which apparently has not officially been set yet. At least not that I could find in any source material. But of course, when there is an update, I'll be sure to post it to my social media. So definitely be sure to check out Campus Crime Podcast on Instagram and Campus Crime Chronicles on Facebook. I also want to address the question that's probably burning inside all of you guys. Did this guy start the Dixie wildfire, the massive fire? And the short answer is no or Probably not. Um, In the research that I've done, nothing has actually come out and said that they think he started it or or his fires or what caused it. Um, And according to official Cal Fire documents, the actual cause of the fire is still undetermined at this time. So did Maynard cause the Dixie fire? The short answer, no. (laughs) Do with that what you will. Um, at this point, it's pretty much just looking like he started a bunch of all these other little fires allegedly, right? That's what we have to say allegedly. So at this point, all we know is that, or all we think we know allegedly is that he started a bunch of little fires that centered around the big massive Dixie fire. And that's it. (laughs) Okay. Y'all that officially brings us to the end of Chronicle 20, but I do want to give a huge shout out to all of you who left me a review on Apple Podcasts because I'm happy to announce I finally reached my goal. Actually, I surpassed it. I didn't just get 50 reviews. I got 51. And I think there's actually more on there now too, but it is all thanks to y'all, my awesome, dedicated listeners. So thank you all so, so very much. Oh, and for those of you who didn't review me, you should totally just still review me because I still need all the reviews I can get. So, okay, that's all for today. So bye for now. Campus Crime Chronicles is researched, written, and recorded by me, Nicole Turner, and it's edited and produced by Big Mad Media. Tune in again in two weeks for the next Chronicle. It's beginning to feel a lot like summer. And the Home Depot has savings on everything you need to get it started this Memorial Day. Step up your grill game with propane griddles from Next Grill for the perfect smash burger. Then feast with your friends and family around a new patio set from Hampton Bay. However you plan to kick off summer, the Home Depot has savings on everything you need to do it right. Feels like Memorial Day at the Home Depot. How doers get more done. 
To make a rich, smooth cold brew, Tim Horton steeps 100% Arabica beans for 16 hours. What could be richer than that? Well, uh... How about blending in swirls of sweet Irish cream? Rich enough? Ooh, I guess. Not quite, because Tim Horton stops that cold brew with the cloud of sweet cold foam. Now, what could be richer than that? Nothing? Exactly. Irish cream cold brew with cold foam now at Tim Hortons. Or try cold foam on any of your Tim Hortons favorites. Modifications extra for a limited time at participating U.S. locations.